Hello, I'm Keith Halliday, and welcome to Our Yukon Commissioners, a television series about the remarkable individuals who've held the important but always evolving role of Yukon Commissioner. Today we're in the former official residence of the Commissioners here in Whitehorse, and we're very honored to have as our guest Mr. Ken McKinnon. Mr. McKinnon, thanks for coming. Thanks, Keith. Glad to be here, back in my living room. Yes, this is your <laughs> former residence. An interesting fact is I was the last resident Commissioner. When I became Commissioner, there was a great number of old timers like Charlie and Betty Taylor and Flo Wired who said, you know, we really are disappointed that the couple of former commissioners before me hadn't been in residence. And how about going into residence, which was not an economic smart thing to do because uh, Northern Affairs charged an economic rent on this building to commissioners. But I said, okay, I'll do it just so that you'll be happy and be able to come to see Judy in residence. Well, I've met a lot of people who remember those days and coming to levies or events at your, when you were here. And uh, that sort of focal point of the commissioner's role it doesn't happen so much now. And m maybe the new move of the office to Taylor House on Main Street will help bring some of that, that focal point back to the office. Yeah, I think that, you know, the role that I had was the last of the transition commissioners. I was the transition commissioner, the last commissioner to serve at pleasure. And we did a lot of events here at the house. One of the events I'll never forget is having the uh, uh, French Consul General giving the Order of Merit uh, from France to Father Jean-Marie Moucher, and we had a lovely reception in the back yard here. And Judy would entertain uh, wives of ambassadors and wives of Consul Generals and wives of ministers who came. And one thing I'm very proud of, we always served country food. We served either salibut and, ham and, sa sa halibut and salmon or moose or bison that we had prepared ourselves and uh, we never charged the government a nickel for it or any of the uh, liqueurs or wines that we would serve with it too because we all knew the problems with, uh, uh, with alcoholism uh, in, in the Yukon so we decided to do all that on our own. Yeah, no, those are great gestures and if you go back to the archives there's photos of this house with the old commissioners, even with the old red ensign before the maple leaf flag, various prime ministers visiting. Um, yeah, no, it's got a neat history. And we entertained the Governor General here, which was fun because they did a full dress rehearsal before and all the black cars were out in the circle, so I mean, the, the, the cul-de-sac here and all of the neighbors were out watching what was happening. One of the really funny events was it that uh, the police were all in the back and I was barbecuing some teriyaki moose in the, in, in the barbecue in the back. All of a sudden I heard this, hey, Ken, what are you cooking? And it was Sergeant Jim King hidden in the bush <laughs> back there. And I said, I'll save one for you, Jim, after the Governor General's gone. So well, it was great fun. A friend of mine told me that he came over here in the 70s to play with his friend, who was the son of the commissioner of the day. And his friend said, oh, sorry, uh, we've got to play with this other kid. Who is it? Uh, it's one of Prime Minister Trudeau's sons who was visiting. <laughs> so they went out in the green belt or something. Yeah, our son who was working at Parks Canada is now as the uh, head warden in Parks Canada uh, he uh, took uh, the Governor General's son on hikes through the park along with one of the aide de camps and we were able to commandeer helicopters and such for the Governor General and the son, so it was quite a day that they had. Excellent. Well, let's get down to the, the meat and potatoes of the interview. Do we have so to? We do. <laughs> I think the viewers would like to know some more about you, so I have my list here. Uh, you were a member of uh, the Territorial Council in the pre-responsible government days from 1961 to 1974, and we'll come back to that interesting time. Uh, Minister of Local Government and, and Highways and Public Works in the, in the 70s. Administrator of the Northern Pipeline Agency here in the Yukon. Um, and after you were Commissioner, of course, you were Chancellor at Yukon College and on the board of uh, YESAB. Um, but I think also maybe one of your most memorable accomplishments is as uh, first president of the Arctic Winter Games. Uh, maybe before we begin the meat and potatoes, just tell us about uh, what you remember about that role. Well, I was uh, on the Yukon basketball team in the first uh, Canada Winter Games, which was in 1967 in Quebec City. And of course, we got trounced. But Commissioner Smith was, or sorry, Commissioner Hodson uh, from the Northwest Territories was looking for something to be a central point of the 100th anniversary of the Northwest Territories in 1970. And I said, well, you know, uh, the Yukon's got a long history of competing with the Northwest Territories, competing with Alaska, but Alaska and the Northwest Territories have never competed against one another. Don't know. We can't have an ordinary jock, fest, jock uh, athletic event. We have to 
hang our hat on something different, you know, and let's have Arctic games and an Arctic cultural exchange because the cultural traditions in Alaska and the Northwest Territories were incredibly similar, but they had never seen each other in doing their cultural events, and they did the same Arctic Winter Games. So anyway, uh, long story short, after two years of traveling through every community in the Northwest Territories and the Yukon and Alaska, people saying we were crazy, I think the editor of the, sports editor of the News of the North at that time, saying, well, that funny tobacco must have uh, landed in the Yukon because that appears to be what Ken McKinnon is smoking if he ever thinks he'll pull this off. And of course, he absolutely apologized to me after the success of the first Arctic Winter Games and said he never believed it could happen. And it did. And of course, it's been an incredible success since then. What you do is you forget all the flops and you just remember the things that you actually produced that turned out good when you get my age. Well, I remember at one of the recent games, my family and I ran into you and you were wearing your regalia from one of the early games. And it really was a learning moment for the kids because they really thought, yeah, somebody started these games and there's a long tradition and it's a, it's a big show now that's very special for children in the North. A lot of mythology behind the games too. <laughs> I, I got to tell the true story of that <laughs> one of these days also. Well, let's go back to the 60s and when you joined Territorial Council. Maybe you could tell the viewer, some of the younger viewers, what exactly was Territorial Council? And, and what was it like when you joined it? What was, the, what was going on in the Yukon in those days? Well, I arrived in, in the Yukon in uh, 1956, working my way through university. And uh, then in 61, I, or I decided or to run for uh, uh, what was then the Territorial Council, Council because I was working towards a political science degree. And really, there wasn't much more for political scientists to do than to run for Territorial Council. And I'd met Eric Nielsen at that time, and the whole point of it was that it was absolutely insane for a 207,000 square mile territory in Canada to be governed by a colonial governor sent out by Ottawa, who absolutely ran every aspect of everyday life in the Yukon politically. And uh, we just said, it's got to stop, it's time. Let's devise a plan, who's gonna go to Ottawa to do it? Eric says, well, I'll go to Ottawa. Uh, you do it from the Yukon, so it wasn't just an ad hoc thing. We actually had lots of meetings and said, this is how we're going to have to do it. This is what we will do, and this is how we'll bring it all about. So very exciting for a young political science student to be able to get involved totally in doing something that only three places in Canada could remain to do. Yukon, the North Historic Alaska. And we recognized also right from the very beginning that if we did not bring the First Nations along in a land claim simultaneously, that it wouldn't happen. So there was a lot of thought that went into it right from the very beginning, and it was a long 20-year process to finally get it to fruition to the EP letter in 1979. But challenging, interesting, demanding, and hectic times. Indeed. And so what were the roles and responsibilities and powers of the Territorial Council in the 60s once you got elected to it? Totally uh, 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 advice to the, uh, to the commissioner, nothing else. It was representative democracy, not responsible democracy, nothing but uh, representing your constituents and advising commissioner of what uh, your representatives thought that the commissioner and Ottawa should do. And we were essentially, I think there was uh, seven members of the council when I was first elected. I think our, uh, our uh, indemnity was $2,500 a year, if I remember correctly, $20 a day for expenses if we were from out of town. And uh, we acted as a seven-person opposition to the federal government and uh, to the commissioner. And there was a lot of people didn't like it at all, a lot of phone calls. Why don't you go back? to where you came from, smart ass, we like it the way it is. We like the commissioner to be the colonial dictator. Why, don't, why are you trying to change things? So don't think it was all uh, that the people were behind us. They weren't at all. It took a lot of years to change attitudes that just because they happened to be in the Yukon, they shouldn't have full democratic rights. Now it was a process with the Territorial Council being very similar to what was in place in Canada you know, 200 years ago before responsible government came to Canada or other former British colonies. What did you learn from how other places had made the evolution in previous generations? Learn more from Alaska than anybody else because Alaska had just become a state 
So uh, I followed the uh, program actually that Claude Naxi, who was the uh, who was the chronicler of the role to Alaska statehood in Alaska, earmarked his book, followed his book of how you get the public on side, how you get the media on side, how you get the, the, the organizations on side, how you get the businesses on side to be able to have the effect of changing the public opinion into this is absolutely necessary for us to 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 be economically viable and to be democratically viable. So that was the approach that we used, uh, using the same methods of uh, convincing the public, convincing the press that Alaska had used. So although we used the same style of going to, from, from, from representative democracy to getting involved in the executive branches, then to full devolution, we used the Alaska methods a lot more than the normal Canadian methods, and very few people know that. Yeah, and it, and it worked effectively for you. And now, uh, you know, 10 or, 10 or 12 years after you were first elected to Territorial Council, then you took on, uh, I think it's the role of uh, Minister of Local Government. Was that a balancing act for you within the regime? You had some executive power, but the commissioner was still in charge. How did that balancing act work? Well, I loved it because I had worked in, in, in during the summers in all of the Yukon communities and really got to know most of the Yukon people. And I was really asked, when we started sharing portfolio responsibilities, which one I would like. And I said, we called it local government. I said, like, Minister of Local Government, because that's where I felt the real action was and where you could really... Uh, you could really convince the people that responsible government was a good idea by being out in the communities and talking to them, working with them. And I remember uh, uh, John Brock, who was the president of Cyprus Anvil, I went out with our deputy minister to Cyprus Anvil. And at that time, they were building the town and the school. And John Brock, the president, said, you know, it'd be a really good idea if we combined with government money and with company money to build the recreational facility in the community, the school. And the deputy minister at that time, being a real bureaucrat, oh no, we can't do that at all, we gotta be separate. I said, that's a really good idea. Let's look at it, examine it, and see whether we combine our money and our talents to build a first class recreation center jointly. And John Buck said, that was the moment I knew responsible government had come to the Yukon. Now you mentioned land claims and First Nations uh, earlier. So in the early 70s, of course, that was when Elijah Smith and the delegation went to Ottawa with uh, our, our people today for our children tomorrow. Uh, tell us about how that process evolved through the mid-70s when you were in your executive roles um, as Minister of Local Government and so on. Well, the Young Turks and the First Nation movement, who I knew really well, and were good friends, uh, Daniel Johnson, uh, Daniel Flynn, now uh, David Joe, uh, Mike Smith, uh, uh, they uh, all thought that it should be bilateral negotiations, that the Yukon shouldn't be involved at all in land claim negotiations. I was beating on the side with Elijah Smith, George Dawson, uh, 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 and people of that uh, nature. And uh, the reason uh, being that I thought I could convince them that under the Yukon Act, we had jurisdiction over so many of the elements that were so important to them, education, uh, game, health and welfare, that the land claims could never succeed without the Yukon being at the party. Joe Jacko was another one of my good old friends that we all met together. So they finally convinced the Young Turks that the Yukon had to be at the table. And I was really honored because my colleagues chose me to be the first territorial negotiator at the land claims table. So they found out that the enemy was not the territorial government, that the First Nations and the territorial government joined against the Yukon, or against the federal government as the enemy. And the land claim could never have succeeded without the Yukon being at the territorial table. That was a major breakthrough that I was extremely proud of. And I think that that was one of the real reasons why it was successful and why the First Nations didn't agree with devolution because they knew that we would support the land claim if they would support devolution. And that's the reason. These were all, I don't think very many people know of all of the background that went in to all of these, uh, these really major accomplishments in the Yukon. But that was the way it uh, was managed and came about.
Yeah, those are foundational moments, foundational decisions. So uh, what did you learn from your Alaskan friends during that process? Because they'd just gone through the Alaskan process. President Nixon had signed off on their law in the early 70s. What, what was good about that and what did you guys do differently? Jay Hammond said, you wait till you get to implementation. You'll wish that you had never gone through this. And you know, both the, 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 the First Nations and the members of the Yukon Legislative Assembly, which we started calling ourselves just to make CBC really mad. <laughs> anyway, uh, eventually, uh, you know, we all knew that we were really in the, in the glory days of what we were accomplishing, such major political accomplishments as land claims and as responsible government, that the real work was going to be what it is right now, the implementation of devolution, both to the Yukon First Nation people and to the Yukon public generally. This is the toughest time I was told by the governors of Alaska that would be exactly the same here as it was there, that it would take years of court cases, years of trials and effort, years of problems before everything got settled down and rationalized. And I think to everybody who says, man, is this ever going to really, are we really going to get there? Yes, we are. And this is the time of implementation, the most difficult time of all. But we will get there. Tell us about the EP letter and the Yukon Achieving Responsible Government, uh, your role in it, and then let's, let's move forward into then you becoming commissioner in the, in the mid-80s after five or six years after the EP letter. Well, the EP letter, was, of course, was the culmination of everything that Eric had done at the federal level and uh, convincing the, uh, the uh, cabinet uh, that, uh, that the responsible government should be accomplished in the Yukon. One of the really funny things about the EP letter, and I've asked both Jake about it and, uh, and Eric, uh, was uh, in the EP letter, it was never imagined that it would be that the government leader could style himself as premier. And anyway, everybody was giving Jake Epp a really get, great guy a bad time that this was the letter, letter that Eric wrote for him to sign and that Eric was really the minister of, of, of I, I think they called it Aboriginal uh, Northern Affairs then. And so Jake put that in the, in the letter just to say, no, this is mine, I'm going to put it in. And, and of course, I asked Jim Smith, Eric, and, and they said, yeah, that, that was uh, Jake. So P Tony Pennington loved it. He picked it up right away and started calling himself uh, a premier. And uh, so the app letter took effectively the powers away from the commissioner and said the, the, uh, the commissioner now had to take the advice of the majority of, uh, of uh, elected members in, in the House, thereby bringing uh, responsible government. See, and Eric Nielsen and I fought viciously about, he was a pure constitutional expert. And he believed that the Yukon Act had to be changed. I said, look at responsible government was accomplished in a lot of the provinces just by instructions to the, from the minister to the commissioner, and, uh, and that was the way it could be accomplished. And of course, that's the way it was finally done. Simple, sweet, total revolution, no marching in the streets, no fireworks, nothing. A simple letter brought responsible government to the Yukon. And uh, yeah, a lot of us had a hand in, in, in the drafting of the letter and the background to it, but it was, if Eric hadn't have been at the federal level and been the minister in charge of everything and been such a powerhouse, I think we'd still be waiting for uh, responsible government. Of course, Joe Clark believed totally in responsible government and uh, was a powerhouse also. So we had a real good uh, bunch behind us. Yeah, no, it's quite, it was quite a team. So then what was it like for you uh, to become commissioner in 1986? On the one hand, it's a great recognition. Uh, on the other hand, you had to move out of your more executive and action-oriented roles into what had become a more ceremonial role. But remember, the commissioner still had powers under the Yukon Act at that time. And the whole point of it was that Eric and the prime minister said, you know, Ken, this would be full circle. Now, if you started, or one of the movers of responsible government, the Yukon, then change the commissioner's role from the colonial government into that of a lieutenant governor, that would complete the circle. And I said, great. So it was still fun being commissioner because there were still powers that the commissioner had. You know, he was still a, served at pleasure. I was the last pleasure appointed commissioner. I served nine years. Now it's the same term as the governor. You know, at those times, uh, 
I used to be wakened in the middle of the night by the RCMP and by the medical association saying we have to commit so and so, so we need your signature immediately because of uh, 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 because of, of mental problems. So the commissioner still signed the orders committing someone to uh, to hospital because of mental problems and. It was, I usually knew all of the families, so then I'd be getting phone calls from the families as commissioners saying, you really don't have to do this. He's not, that person is not, doesn't need to be incarcerated or committed, you know? And so it was really difficult. And those are things that I said the commissioner had no reason being involved in. And so we were able to do all of those, put all those powers in the hands where they rightfully should have been in the elected members and the minister's hands. So there was all kinds of, of uh, problems like that, and I took great delight in sending people who came to petition me because they still thought I had power over to the legislative assembly. And said, this is the person that you have to see over there. They got the power now, not me, and things have changed. So uh, it was great uh, doing that transition from still being having some powers and uh, giving them up and uh, making the commissioner much more like a lieutenant governor. But I still had uh, took on real roles, I, uh, or roles that I thought were very valuable to the public. I was serving as the president of the Council of Canadian uh, Unity at that time. I was serving as the director on the Arctic Institute of North America. I was putting together the Arctic Winter Games, which your father was intrinsically involved in. Dave Porter, who was the commissioner or the Minister of Tourism, I asked all of the ex-commissioners to serve on the board, putting the, uh, I, I'm sorry, that was the Yukon Anniversaries Commission that I'm talking about. You know, people think that the uh, Canadian Winter Games was the really biggest thing that Yukon ever put on. Not at all, because everything that I do, I demand that we complete a cost-benefit analysis, what it did for the Yukon. Because of the Yukon Anniversaries Commission, the 50th anniversary of the completion of the Alaska Highway, we increased tourism 20% in one year in 1992, the largest increase ever in the Yukon Territory. Remember, this was a year-long celebration between BC, the Yukon, and Alaska. It was a moving festival for 12 months through these three uh, jurisdictions. And we looked at, uh, at, at the, who our target audience would be. We saw that the uh, people who were served then would be getting to the age where they'd have children and grandchildren who they wanted to say, what did you do in the war, Daddy? Grandpa, we built the Alaska Highway. Come on up and see what we did, which was exactly the target audience that we went for, and they all came. No, I remember how hard my father worked on that with you. And you guys said, uh, you've set a big bar for the 75th anniversary people to jump over in 2017. And what we did is make your dad, who I'd, I'd worked with him on Chamber of Commerce events uh, before and always worked well with him. And of course, Jimmy Smith was on and the other commissioners. We'd all worked well together. And I said for Jimmy and for Chuck, your dad, to be in charge of the financial affairs because these guys were so cheap with the taxpayer's dollar that there wasn't one dime that was misrepresented in that. And I knew that if Jimmy and, and, and your dad were handling the financial affairs, there would never be a question of one nickel going missing, which there wasn't. Well, let's wrap up with one last question. Let's get your thoughts. What did you learn during your time as commissioner? And uh, you know, what are your perspectives on, on that role? Well, the role is exactly where it should be now. I think every commissioner has to really say, what am I going to do with my time? And what can I do to really benefit the Yukon while I'm here? You know, I, our present commissioner, Doug Phillips, I know that he's so interested in youth arts that that really has become his major interest. And everywhere that he goes and every event that he does, he, he uh, highlights some of our great young Yukon artists and musicians. So I think everybody has to do that because you could, I think in the present role, you could kind of get bored to death just signing bills and going to the legislator a couple of years ago and say, I agree to these bills. So I kept, uh, incredibly busy, that's one thing I learned, that, uh, uh, that you want to, and I think uh, that you should. And uh, I guess, uh, I, you know, it's hard to say what you really, I, I think I knew the Yukon really well through a long, long uh, career dealing with the Yukon and through both the entrepreneurial sector and the public 
sector, so there were no surprises there. I thought I, I, I think it was fun changing the role of the commissioner from still having some powers into, a, into that of a, a, a lieutenant governor. But uh, having worked with so many commissioners, having known the role of the commissioner and what it should be, and having been in uh, elected uh, to the Territorial Council and then the Legislative Assembly for four terms, uh, there were no surprises, really. Well, Ken, thanks very much for joining us today. That was a great discussion, and thanks for sharing your thoughts um, through the Yukon's, you know, a big chunk of the Yukon's constitutional development. We appreciate it. Thanks, Keith. It was fun. Today we're lucky to have with us a constitutional expert, Kirk Cameron. Uh, Kirk uh, worked for the federal government in Ottawa in Indian and Northern Affairs, was the Deputy Minister of Executive Council Office uh, here in the Yukon government, which is the epicenter of things constitutional where the commissioner and the government come together, and, and then finally has liter literally written the book on uh, constitutional developments in the Yukon. Uh, Kirk, thanks for joining us today. Good to be here, Keith. Now, uh, you, like I, am a graduate of F.H. Collins, so for the benefit of any Law 12 students that are out there cramming for finals or getting ready for their next exam, can you give us the two-minute the two version of the history of the role of the Commissioner from 1898 to today? That's a tall order, but I'm, I'm working on it. Uh, really, Keith, there are four phases of what would be considered Commissioner in the history of the Yukon Territory dating back to 1898. The first phase is 98 to about 1909, um, at which time representative government was fully established in the territory with a fully elected territorial council. Between eight, no, 98, eight, uh, 98 and 09, the, com the commissioner had all responsibilities that are normally associated with a provincial or territorial government, uh, including the legislative function, the exec all of the executive function and was even the senior most uh, official for uh, all Ottawa departments uh, in the Yukon Territory. 09, as I say, the legislative function moved over to an elected, um, fully elected assembly. Uh, and that period, that next period from 09 to 1970 is really a, a, a time when legislative function sat with a council of some kind. It shrunk during the low periods of the Yukon uh, economy. Uh, but then grew back again um, in the 40s and 50s, um, heading out toward 19, 1970, as I say. Um, the uh, legislative function with the council, the commissioner still holding all of the executive functions, which included being able to put before the legislative body called the Territorial Council, uh, initiation of all bills, initiation of budgets, and so on. So the commissioner still an incredibly power powerful figure within the territorial context. From 70 to 79, I, I call that sort of the transition period where uh, uh, effectively the role of the commissioner moved from being that of a, uh, an executive uh, leader within the overall territorial structure, moved over to being that uh, more akin to a lieutenant governor uh, and that role of lieutenant governor-esque uh, uh, position has been in place uh, from 1979 when the JCAP Minister of Indian and Northern Affairs letter was issued to the Territorial Commissioner of the day, Ion Christensen, saying, please remove yourself from all functions that are e executive in nature and turn those over to representatives who, who uh, enjoy uh, a majority in the Legislative uh, Assembly of the Yukon Territory. So those are the, roughly, those are the four phases, the Commissioner being a different kind of creature in each one of those four. Thanks very much, Kirk. We'll make sure we get those typed up and shared with next year's Law 12 class. Perfect. Uh, let's go back to the heroic or the pioneer phase of the Yukon government in the you know, 10 or 20 years after 1898. Some very big figures like Ogilvy and, uh, and George Black uh, filled the commissioner's shoes. What sort of things would they have done? Can you, can you give us an example of some of their exploits? Um, sure. I mean, th this was a really interesting time in the Yukon Territory. Of course, with the gold rush, we had a population cresting 40,000 people, uh, uh, many of whom were, were foreigners. They were Americans or from elsewhere on the planet. There were uh, tugs and push uh, in the Yukon Territory as to who had sovereignty, who had control of the territory. And the commissioner, being that senior most person in the territory, uh, had to rule over all of the stuff associated with not only uh, the basics of administration of a growing uh, population, 
uh, but also having to deal with uh, the law and order side of the of the equation uh, because of those uh, those uh, foreigners coming into the to the uh, the gold fields. So very interesting times, really tough time for the commissioner. The commissioner's office was like a bit of a turnstile. We had Walsh, Ogilvy, Ross, uh, Newlands, um, uh, Wood and Cong Congdon all from uh, 1897 all the way through to, to 1905, 1907. So very much a tough job and one that uh, took an awful lot of time for uh, individuals to uh, really get on top of again, but, but one that burned people out pretty quickly. Yeah, and a, and a big time here. I mean, the border with Alaska wasn't even fully defined yet until right. 1905, and, uh, and building up a government apparatus in a place that 10 years before had been um, largely just the realm of prospectors. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned uh, quiet times for the Yukon economy in the 20s and 30s. The, uh, the economy really slowed down. The population fell dramatically, uh, and, uh, and the federal government um, you know, reduced the role and scope of the Territorial Council and the, the government here. How did that period go? Yes, as a matter of fact, uh, in 1918, I believe, they, they looked at the possibility of even doing away with the Territorial Council altogether uh, due to strong protest uh, from Yukoners at the time, uh, having heard of this uh, prospect. Uh, they, the federal government relented, even though technically it was on the books that they could have abolished the Territorial Council at the time. I think it was reduced down to three members uh, throughout that quiet period um, and only started to grow again back in the 1950s, I think was when they first started to, uh, the, the council was increased in size. Um, the commissioner actually uh, did the, the, the formal title, the formal role was actually uh, done away with. Uh, it ended up being transferred over to the gold commissioner and even that post was then taken away, and I think it was a comptroller was the terminology used in the Yukon Act uh, uh, of that senior most official who took on all of the commissioner's functions uh, and, the, and the gold commissioner's functions throughout uh, much of the 30s and 40s. Um, there were some interesting times in the history throughout that period. At one point as well, there was the, uh, the, uh, the threat of British Columbia annexing part of southern Yukon. Um, under Premier Duff Patella in the 1930s, I believe it was, um, seeing uh, very interesting potential for, for Southern Yukon as part of a British Columbia. We were saved by the Catholic schools question that uh, ultimately Duff didn't want to get uh, tied up into a constitutional debate about uh, setting up Catholic schools in, in the province of British Columbia and what those rights would look like. So as a consequence, he did back away from that proposal, but we almost lost a chunk of our territory as a consequence of the, the politics and the, and the uh, interesting times uh, in that period. Of course, the commissioner would have been involved in all of those discussions. Uh, we, we had commissioners uh, and, as I say, controller, comptroller, those positions taking on that kind of a role. All of those individuals played quite an active part in those great debates uh, throughout that quiet period. And of course, Premier Patello of British Columbia, as a, as a young man, had been in the Klondike Gold Rush and was a lawyer in Dawson, and even, I think, was involved in sending the, uh, the hockey team to play for the Stanley Cup in Ottawa. Uh, but just, uh, just for the viewer, am I right to think that because the Yukon at that time had a Catholic school, British Columbia did not, he was concerned that by taking over part of the Yukon, he would be, in effect, importing uh, Catholic schools into British Columbia, which, for his own, based on his own political beliefs, he did not want to do. Is that right? It would have raised the political debate uh, to quite, quite a hue and cry in the province, and that was something he just did not want to go there. Now, let's flash forward to uh, the EP letter in, uh, in the late 70s. In 1979, Prime Minister Clark's in office in Ottawa. And of course, many parts of the British Empire and other parts of Canada had evolved from a more uh, colonial-style government through to responsible government. Uh, we did that in the late 70s. Um, tell us how that process went. Yes, Keith, we actually started that around 1970. Uh, that was, I believe, the year that the Executive Committee was established, which brought, which brought uh, the first of the elected members of the Legislative Assembly, then called the Territorial Council, into the executive function, which is today known as the Cabinet uh, Executive um, uh, Structure. Uh, so that evolution started in 70 when, again, two, two, ML, two MLAs were brought into the Executive Committee. It evolved throughout the 70s where more of that executive role was taken over by more individuals being brought in from the legislative body into the executive. And ultimately, the EP letter basically enshrined what was already almost all the way in practice, that being uh, 
that the commissioner would be um, maybe a chairing function, but would not be actively as actively involved in that executive role. And then, of course, Epps' letter actually removed the commissioner altogether and uh, created uh, this this latest phase where the the commissioner, in in all respects, acts very much as a as a lieutenant governor. Now, it's quite remarkable, and I think maybe for the viewers worth uh, worth pointing out. Uh, this did not require an act of parliament, a constitutional amendment. It was simply, you know, uh, Jake Epp was the Minister of Northern Affairs or whatever they called it at the time, and he mm -hmm. could simply send a letter and cause this uh, fundamental change in how we're governed in the North. Absolutely. That could be done by the Commissioner. Interestingly enough, uh, your, your uh, watchers may be uh, aware, but uh, a lot of people aren't, that uh, that function, that capacity of the Minister in Ottawa to issue letters of instruction to the Commissioner has been removed from our Yukon Act. Uh, it's no longer there. The federal government would have to go back into Parliament and amend the Yukon Act for there to be actual direction given to the territorial government on, on matters, uh, through the Commissioner, on matters relating to either the executive or the legislative functions of government here in Yukon. That's a big deal. That, that happened in 2013, 10 years after the, uh, the devolution of land and resource, uh, resources from the federal government to the Yukon government, uh, which I consider to be a big day for us. So it's becoming ever harder for the federal government, although it's still possible for them to wind back the clock like they did in the 20s and 30s, um, should, uh, should any federal government for some, some unforeseen reason want to reduce the powers of the Yukon government. Mm -hmm. And, and I w I'll go out on a limb here and say it's even, it's even tougher than that, and, and that's because so much of the inst in institutional framework of the Yukon Territory is now locked up in a large C constitutional document, that being the land claim agreements in the Yukon Territory. So if you're going to now change the nature of the, of the institutional framework for the territorial government in the Yukon, I suggest that pretty soon you're going to be hitting up against that uh, land claim wall, and therefore you're going to be opening up land claim agreements uh, that are of a constitutional nature in this country. So it's the ratchet effect, difficult to move backwards. Uh, looking forward, uh, what's your perspective uh, now that the commissioner is largely a ceremonial role similar to a lieutenant governor, uh, devolution has occurred, what is the difference between the Yukon Territory and the province? In practice, I would say almost nothing. I, I don't believe that there are individuals out there who believe that because it's styled as administration and control of land and resources, we don't own it. I've written on this subject before. The Supreme Court of Yukon, the Supreme Court of Northwest Territories has actually at various times made, uh, uh, given, rendered decisions that have said um, there is a nascent crown in right underlying the nature of uh, the Yukon and the Northwest Territories and its relationship to land and resources. So even though the language is somewhat archaic uh, and connects back to an older day, I think the reality is we are all but a province uh, in, in all but name. So, so there, there isn't much more that we could get, if you will, um, that would give us uh, more of, a, of a, uh, an independent re representative and responsible government here in the Yukon Territory. And what would be required in theory for us to become the 11th province, you know, like our friends in Alaska have done, mm -hmm. uh, becoming the 49th state? Yeah, highly, highly debatable point. Uh, some have argued, uh, Peter Hogg, as a matter of fact, has argued, uh, uh, one of Canada's foremost constitutional ex experts has argued that um, it could be done by simple act of parliament, that that jurisdiction actually remains, uh, rests with parliament and with the federal government. Um, but most people say that it would pr probably be trigger the seven, uh, 7 of 10 rule uh, amending formula in the Constitution itself. Some have even argued that the, the, there would have to be unanimity um, uh, across all provinces uh, and the federal government uh, and parliament to be able to put in place a new province in, in the country. Um, given that, my sense is we probably will never see a province like the 10 that we've got today. Uh, and that's not just because I think it would be incredibly difficult to get it through that constitutional amending process, but I also think that it would never look quite the same. Because again, as I mentioned earlier, the nature of our institutional framework is now tied up in co-management relationships with First Nations here in the Yukon Territory. So at a minimum, that would have to be recognized in whatever our letters patent might look like that would create uh, a new Yukon province. Uh, and so that new generation of province, if you will, will look significantly different than the first 10. Well, Kirk, it'll be exciting to see these things develop over the future years, depending whether we go in that direction or some other direction. 
Um, looking forward to your next book on Yukon constitutional developments. Thanks very much for joining us today. Thanks so much, Keith.